Welcome back to Interventions. Interestingly, we uh, envisioned this program as a geopolitical alternative to some of the what, two months into broadcasting? This is actually the first time we're even discussing geopolitics. So, so uh, belated, but uh, nonetheless, here we are. And joining us to discuss some very important issues uh, is Nils Wegner, uh, a great writer, a great thinker in his own right, and uh, our correspondent from the heartland of Europe. How are you doing, Nils? Oh, pretty fine. You know, as, as those crazy... Uh Florida-based uh, industrial metal bands, Hansel and Gretel would say, ich bin der Kraut mit der großen Schnitzel. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but it sounds funny anyway. Uh, all right. Well, so we had planned to do this, I guess, some time ago, a few months ago. Uh, time got away from us, but this is an important issue nonetheless. So, uh, let's just get into it. In July, uh, the U.S., uh, under Trump, obviously, chose to uh, redeploy 9,500 American service members who were stationed in Germany um, under NATO uh, and and uh, redistribute them across the continent. And Mills is here to help us understand kind of the, the implications of this and uh, what it means geopolitically, what it means uh, to think, to go back to the title of this program, Wither and Leviathan, what it means for America as the preeminent superpower. So I'll just uh, turn it over to you, Nils. Uh, what's going on in Germany? What's going on with NATO? And, and how should we think about it? Well, I would like to propose the thesis that this step, being a bit theatrical as one might expect because it's just about, I guess, half of the US troops stationed in Germany. Uh, it is a, a symbol of the US and of NATO uh, being more or less uh, a, 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 a puppet of the US kind of uh, abandoning Central Europe. And uh, this is not really that much of a scandal because it is only a a, uh, a fitting step, right? <laughs> not exactly right, but uh, a few decades after the end of the Cold War. Because if we regard Germany as the pivot of Europe, or at least of Central Europe, its status as a pretty much a US protectorate that uh, was more or less fitting, thinking in the in the duality of the bloc confrontation of the Cold War, had of course have to come to an end after the Soviet Union broke apart. And um, the very problem with this is that, uh, as as nasty people like to call it great Western Germany because the the former uh, communist part was not really um, was not really unified with Western Germany but rather uh, swallowed up via certain uh, constitutional machinations because back in 1990 when it was all about the due process of integrating the the former democratic uh, republic of germany into the federal republic of germany uh, many people especially on the right of the political spectrum hoped that this uh, at that time more or less unforeseen case because uh, most western politicians especially the conservative ones had already given up hoping for a reunification of the divided german uh, fatherland um, most people on the right hoped this uh, unforeseen case would trigger article 146 of uh, the german grundgesetz which is uh, our surrogate of a constitution which says that this Grundgesetz, this basic uh, constitution-like law, does only apply as long there is no, uh, or until the free German people has had an opportunity to give itself a real 
um, sovereign and free constitution because this Grundgesetz was more or less uh, worked out under the supervision of uh, the three Western occupational powers, the US, France, and Britain. Well, anyway, they found a workaround uh, around this Article 146. They did not, uh, did not the Western German state did not cease to exist and uh, co-found a new state entity together with the former Eastern German state, but the Western German state uh, swallowed the the those new territories like in like an amoeba or something like that. And uh, so it was just about um, getting getting rid of the 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 existing eastern german army the eastern german political infrastructure and uh, to replace it with western german infrastructure uh, where they saw fit um so all the occupational the western occupational powers remained for a short time at least um the soviets left pretty uh, pretty fast the the russians and and, and uh, the the soldiers from other former soviet unions uh, returned to their their to their own homelands whereas uh, the american state both their troops and their weaponry we uh, have american nuclear warheads on german soil which the german government uh, pays for pays for its maintenance with german uh, taxpayer money but uh, has no power to use them because to use them would uh, necessitate the agreement of the American government. And so it's more or less just um, some high tier um, garage owner for US nuclear warheads. And um, besides that, we also host various uh, pretty important uh, US military infrastructure for uh, expeditionary warfare all around the world, like uh, the the huge uh, lunch dual military hospital and um, various uh, various infrastructure points for drone warfare and the like. Rammstein Air Base should be pretty well known not only for the aviation accident we had there, but on, uh, also for for its um, pivotal role in in droning uh, uh, Pakistanis and uh, others in the, in the so-called war against terror. And so uh, Germany is more or less what Britain was originally meant to be kind of like uh, some some infrastructural uh, aircraft carrier for US power, US military power in Europe. But nowadays, uh, since the fronts have shifted ever since the Soviet bloc broke down and NATO has expanded eastwards uh, during the last, uh, I believe it was 15 years, uh, the NATO East expansion, um, we have seen a change in in power dynamics here, and uh, neither Central Europe nor Germany is that important anymore for uh, U.S. military grand strategy, I believe, and uh, geopolitics in and of itself, because most Central European powers do not have a army that could uh, stand on its own maybe except for France and uh, especially Britain, but uh, I believe even that could be um, disputed. And so this whole talk of uh, removing troops as some sort of punishment for the German government not fulfilling its NATO uh, obligations to commit uh, around 2% of its GDP for, uh, for NATO efforts uh, is just more or less a fraud because um, how and why should the German government? Because most uh, governmental money is spent on various uh, social uh, endeavors, especially when it comes to immigration and uh, caring for uh, caring for people living uh, around the poverty limits. And on the other hand, the federal armed forces, the Bundeswehr, have been uh, 
step by step reduced to a a a hollow um, bulk of an army uh, ever since uh, ever since the end of the Cold War, and uh, right now, uh, as we've seen, the uh, nowadays president of the uh, European Commission, Miss. Uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, who has been the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, of the Federal Republic of Germany before she went to Brussels, um, pretty much uh, used this this ministry as a host for various uh, for various advice uh, agencies that she invited to come in and uh, and work on the the the, the reformation and. Uh, the um, overhaul of, of the federal armed forces to just come in, grab the money and leave. And what we've got from that were um, helicopters that wouldn't work and that took almost 30 years to, uh, to develop. We have had uh, armored personal carriers, brand new, armored, uh, brand new APCs that uh, had to go back to the factory to be uh, refitted so that uh, pregnant female soldiers would not be harmed when they would uh, drive across uh, uh, rocky terrain with with this tank and stuff like that so it's it's getting it's becoming more and more of a joke and uh, this all ties in with nato becoming more and more obsolete at least regarding its original purpose of securing the the north atlantic um, geopolitical space for trade and for uh, naval security and thus the uh, the title of this this whole thing withering leviathan uh, that we came up with pretty much fits the current situation in more than just one way because um, when we think of a leviathan we do not only think of a a sea monster as it is in uh, i believe it's uh, even talmudic uh, or, or or somewhat uh, uh, Levantine mythology, correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, but we also, of course, think about the Leviathan of Thomas Hobbes, which is the symbol of the sovereign uh, state and uh, and the, the very powerful and mighty uh, sovereign state, which would probably allude to the US nowadays, but maybe that's uh, an illusion or it's starting to become an illusion. Um, so <laughs> instead of me rambling on and on, uh, please tell me if I'm right about this uh, mythological uh, part on the Leviathan front, Ty. Yes, yes you are. So this is pretty much it. Uh, in short, again, I believe uh, this troop withdrawal, this uh, more or less symbolic troop withdrawal that as far as I know has still to be done, um, is pretty much a symbol for the US uh, turning its gaze away from Central Europe. And this of course has uh, the Central European governments uh, on their toes because not only uh, do they need positive ties to the US uh, with regards to economy and, and uh, power dynamics, international power dynamics, but their interior power and their legitimacy is to a large degree founded upon a close and positive relationship to the US. Uh, especially when these governments are ruled by Christian democratic parties because traditionally ever since uh, 1945 those have been the european parties to uh, collaborate with uh, the us and with nato uh, to the largest degree especially in germany in uh, italy and uh, to a much lesser degree but that's uh, that's another whole story uh, in france because france uh, was of course not a um, defeated nation of the Second World War, but had a very complicated history with uh, s s kind of social democratic, but more or less communist uh, government. So, um, yeah, what we have now with uh, Emmanuel Macron and his uh, social populist government, uh, 
is another story, but also ties in with uh, Europe, or in this case, not Europe, but the uh, European Union uh, getting ready for uh, more or less abandonment by the US and trying to find a position of power to work against that. Well, that's, uh, my gosh, you're like a fountain of knowledge, Mills. I appreciate that. Uh, take a sip, take, take a smoke break. But uh, no, in all seriousness, that was, yeah, that's very informative. Uh, and I, I wasn't too sure <laughs> if if that, um, if, if the, the movement of troops had happened either in doing some research for this. It doesn't seem that there's been a whole lot of reporting on this issue since it first happened over the summer. Um, I'll throw a quote at you two of you guys, and maybe uh, to give Mills a break, uh, we can start with Tyler. I'm going to butcher this name, so to our uh, German audience, please don't take offense. But uh, the German foreign foreign minister, uh, Heiko Maas, uh, was recently quoted as saying that uh, the real game changers of the era of on the present American global policeman is over. Everyone can see that. It is not due to a lack of U.S. military power, but to the commitment of those responsible in the White House. So the shifting away from kind of, you know, really what defined, especially the, the early part of this century, 2000s, 2010, uh, but long before that as well, uh, of the Amer of America just having military troops everywhere sending troops everywhere, uh, uh, installing democratic regimes, quote unquote, everywhere. Uh, you know, Heiko Mass is saying this is, this era is over. So I guess the question is, um, is this pivoting away from a, a global American police state? Is this a response to Trumpism? Uh, or is it using Trumpism to cover up genuine American military failures? Is there some other reason for this kind of uh, public de declaration? Tyler, you first. Well, I, I think it's a bit of both. Um, to be quite to be quite frank, you see this with the Democrats as well, is there's no real, I think, commitment at the seat of American power to actually completely change and review the current American strategy when it comes to maintaining hegemony and unipolar order. Because if you look at unipolar order after World War II, and then you have the Cold War, as Mills was talking about, is they had all the leverage they needed because there was always a looming threat of communism, right? And so when it came to other states and rogue states, for example, they could always appeal to like, you know, we need more, we need more funding from America. We need more American influence because we're if we don't, no matter if they were like purely liberal democratic or not, they could always say, well, if we don't, then the threat of communism can come in and take us out. So America needs to have its presence in X, Y, or Z region or state, right? So America actually had a stronger um, footing in regards to actually needing to use military power and a largely unilateral rule when it comes to decision-making because they were the seat in this Cold War, right? But the situation that we're in now is really showing how this over-reliance on American military power is actually coming to a heel and is becoming very, um, it's contributing to its own waning, really, I would say, to American hegemony. Because if you look at how, for example, China and Russia are playing the game, they're more willing to actually going along with the mandates of the United Nations and actually using liberal democratic um, mechanisms within that to actually gain more and more influence, while America, on the other hand, is playing this America first game. So they're playing this unilateral game in which they're saying, okay, we're going to drop out of uh, the World Health Organization. We're not going to do these um, international mandates on COVID. We're going to solve it our own way, which just largely ends up being um, in action when it comes to practice, right? And so there's this commitment to a kind of outdated model of the world when it comes to the use of American military power and American hegemony. And so now these other states, which the United States could actually potentially have influence in, are starting to turn to Russia and China, and even Russia and China, while not being entirely allies, of course, are willing to actually engage and speak with each other and play ball with the international order while America is playing this um, unipolar game, but that's actually contributing to its waning because it's not keeping up with current geopolitical strategy. It's trying to maintain a military hegemony while all other forms of hegemony and dominance like um, 
economic and being a world leader in results to say the pandemic and things like this is you really see the cracks starting to split through. And this inability to see this is something that's on both Democrat and Republican side. And so, so far, I see that that influence is indeed starting to wane and it's because of a strategy that's largely outdated. Nils, what are your thoughts on that particular issue? Well, um, what else is there to say? Um, we are seeing China trying to take over everything and to break that which it cannot take over by means of uh, economical power, economical strife. Um, there are also machinations at work that we do not even see through yet. I believe uh, there was this there was this story going around that that uh, the Chinese uh, bought Grinder, this this gay dating app, I believe, and then also um, bought heavily into already established facial recognition technology and people were suspecting they would try to uh, try to um, assemble uh, user data from from grinder from this this gay dating app and uh, look through the user data for for people working in uh, working high tier in in, in large uh, economical structures and in the military and stuff like that and then uh, just start blackmailing people uh, like look at this profile we have of you and uh, I, I believe you wouldn't like your wife to see this and stuff like that so they could just uh, direct geopolitics this way uh, this is far more um, intricate than just uh, sending a, a carrier battle group into the Persian Gulf and uh, do the usual thing, use the big sticks to to scare the shit out of people. And um, yeah, um, the way the US acts uh, is still kind of, uh, let's say, Reaganite, do large stuff with large guns and uh, make large use with that. Whereas this is nowadays to a large degree unnecessary living in the in the information age and uh, other global players uh, can achieve similar, uh, similar, um, um, oh, God damn it, can achieve similar things with, uh, investing, uh, a lot less money. Mm -hmm. So the U S kind of bleeds itself out in, in behaving the way it has done for the past five decades and not adopting to the new ways of the world. And re with regards to the Democrats, as, as we uh, were talking about that, or you brought that up, um, look at the Obama presidency. Um, he promised to pull out of Afghanistan or Iraq or both, I believe. I don't know. Okay, but anyway, he did, nothing, he did nothing to do so. And uh, we still have to see if uh, Trump will at least do a partial uh, withdrawal from there. So it is kind of a, it's kind of a cul-de-sac for, for US foreign policy because it is always torn between uh, the interest of uh, neoconservative and globalist uh, pressure groups. And on the other hand, um, the domestic problems that come with that because um, the American populace, I believe, is to a large degree not willing to support any more foreign wars and uh, presidents as well as uh, the parties on a state level have to take that into consideration, even though uh, sad pressure groups might uh, pull the lever on their money. Right on, right on. So the um, the other thing that has come up uh, as a result of, of these maneuvers um, earlier in the year, Macron uh, kind of gave his vision for a new European Union. And shortly thereafter, he saw this kind of at least symbolic reshaping of NATO. 
uh, or the, the relations between uh, the various constituent states. Uh, one, one region that has come up as, as very important uh, in a lot of these movements uh, are, is the Indo-Pacific uh, region. I guess my question then, uh, Nils, you were talking before about, uh, actually Tyler as well, about you know, how much uh, rebuffing communism had a, had a role to play in, in NATO and all of these kinds of things. Uh, there does seem to be a shift away from that. I guess the question is strategically, what is the value of improved uh, Indo-Pacific relations for the US uh, and even for the EU? Uh, Tyler, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Sorry, what was the question exactly? I'm trying to fix our super chats. What's the question exactly? Just the end part. <laughs> yeah, what is, uh, there seems to be a renewed focus on the Indo-Pacific relations, the US to the Indo-Pacific EU, uh, strategically and militarily, what, what's the significance of this? Um, do you wanna take that, Nils? I think this is a little more your, your area. Um, I would have to lie if I was to say that uh, I had read too much into that, but I believe it's just a shift towards uh, newcomers on, on the geopolitical stage. I mean, of course, India uh, is not a, a actual newcomer because uh, it's been a nuclear power for, I believe almost 80 years now and uh, of course it's uh well shall we say economic power uh is pretty much undisputed but uh, it has been kind of uh kind of forgotten or dismissed for the longest time and since as uh i believe Europe is kind of being pushed aside by now or starting to become pushed aside. Um, the, the eyes of the, the uh, strategists, the geopolitical strategists, both in, in Washington as well as in uh, Beijing or in Moscow are turning to other large nations and uh, large powers. India would be pretty much the first one that comes to mind, at least to me. And uh, I would have to think a bit longer if there are any ar around that compared to India. Um, it's it's it maybe just just the more or less desperate search for new allies and new new pivots to work the world <laughs> geopolitical machinations from. But uh, that's what comes to my mind spontaneously. Right, like from what from what I've heard about it and what I've read, which is very brief, but what I understand is that there's increased aggression from China over the South China Sea, right? And so there's a lot of there's a lot of conflict in regards to um, India, Japan, and Philippines as well that are wanting to ally with the U.S. and the U.S. wants to ally with them in order to maintain that hegemony over the sea powers, right? And the disputes in that China is getting a lot more aggressive in that region. So I would think that the seed of that strategy is to maintain hold on that, because if you don't do that, and then if China starts becoming, taking more and more of that, the sea area and islands and that, then they become more within influencing range and striking range to the United States. So it's in the United States interest to have hold over this, but it's also in the interest of these smaller nations like Japan and them to have United States allying with them so that they can have a bulwark, a stronger power against China's increased aggress aggression in the region. So this is also why we have seen uh, border clashes between India and China in, in the, the past few months, I believe, right? Yeah. I believe in the, in the Himalaya region, there were some, some, uh, stone throwings at at the border because they have uh, some sort of de-weaponized zone there so they do not jump at each other's throats instantaneously but they actually uh had a few casualties there so it's it's uh yeah kind of like the the uh, ever-growing tension maybe between uh, japan and china right before the outbreak of the the uh, xeno japanese war in uh, 19th 
37, I believe. Well, anyway. Um, from also the the European states are also condemning China over South China Sea very recently. So what what it seems to be then is a disregard for international law in regards to South China Sea. So it's not just the United States that's condemning that, but what it seems to be the case is the United States is using that to gain more allies in the region in regards to having a foothold, right, which protects their power and their defense, but it also gives good incentive to Japan and those nations and the Philippines to actually maintain their relations with America. Because from what I understand, the Philippines actually wanted to withdraw from their allyship with America recently, but this seems to have actually pulled them back into it and have not broken that uh, that allyship. I get uh, much has been made of the Chimerica relationship. It's, there's there's a, a tenuous but kind of incestuous uh, economic relationship that we have uh, with China. They make things, we buy things. Uh, I just, I guess, I just wonder, you know, especially under Trump trying to make inroads into India to have a maybe another avenue to apply pressure to China. I even read recently that, that some of the trade negotiations or renegotiations between the US and China have not gone uh, as the way Trump kind of advertised that they would uh, running into, you know, all through his campaign. I guess uh, if you, either of you guys are capable of doing this, just kind of offering maybe your, put on your little Nostradamus hat and offer some prophetic Prophetic? Well, obviously, but um, what are your thoughts, Tyler? Uh, you actually cut out for a sec, right? When you said, put on your Nostradamus hat and offer some prophetic, and then you cut out. Uh, offer some uh, prophetic visions or insights about the nature of the American and Chinese uh, relationship over the next couple of years. Uh, some of that will be dependent on the outcome of the election, I'm sure. But um, what are your kind of intuitions about how this dynamic shapes out? Well, I I think like looking at it now, and I don't know how much it would really change so much with the Democrats. I mean, what Biden is basically proposing is this kind of renewal of the American internationalist order pre-America first, but in actuality, in terms of policy, it's not really that different from what Trump is doing in regards to America first. So regardless of which one it is, I don't see too much change in the trends. What I do think is happening is that with China, there seems to be a greater sense of weakening in regards to America's military hegemony, but also in regards to their influence on international order and setting the tone for what arena international conflict is actually going to be on because they're losing that influence in regards to these rising civilization stage states, China, Russia, and then the proposal idea from Macron to have the European civilizational state, which regardless of whether or not Europe is successful in doing that, what is the case is that America is relying increasingly on a failing strategy. And so what I see happening between these two nations is if America stays on the course that it stays, is greater and greater influence from China without actually having to fire a shot, right? While in the case of America, they seem to be playing on the same strategy that is not going to work in the long term. And so I think that China is going to have a better influence in the long run. But that being said, this is not to say that China's success is entirely guaranteed either. Like if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, um, this does sound like a great idea if they manage to pull it off. But the problem is, is that a lot of China's economy is so bound up with American manufacturing, right? This, you know, Chimerica economy, basically. And same with Canada and China, is that if this conflict continues to escalate, then the United States could potentially pull the rug out from under their feet just by withdrawing. And that would put a, a bit of a break of sorts on what China is proposing. So in this case, then, it would have to be moving to an alternate kind of currency other than what 
the American one is, which is guaranteeing their dominance, basically, of sorts. But if America continues to wane, then so will that currency and so will the alternatives rise up and so will the alliances between these formerly rogue states in regards to China and Russia. So I think at the end, China is going to be the stronger one. So I have another question for you, Nils, but if you wanted to chime in on that, you're more than welcome to. Um, uh, I believe that if uh, Biden becomes president in, in November, uh, is elected in November and becomes president uh, at the beginning of next year, um, I guess the Democrats have learned that the usual average Joe six-pack, white, blue-collar, working-class American is not to be underestimated. And they will surely have to do something to placate uh, this constituency. But in the end, um, they have no real gain from uh, implementing some sort of uh, lessened, weakened, economical America first policy. And uh, thus, it's just going to snap back to normal, to pre-Trump, uh, I believe. Maybe China will not play that because uh, there are few, uh, not, not few, there are quite some uh, projects going on like the new Silk Road as a as a very prominent example where they seem to look out for options to get away from their economic uh, dependency on the US and maybe this this will uh, continue over the next few years and maybe even decades so sooner or later um, the US will be kind of uh, declassed as a as an economical partner and uh, the remaining uh, global big players will uh, yeah will will focus on one another and uh, not care so much for uh, what Washington has to say anymore not only because they have learned something about um, reliability or the lack thereof within the Trump presidency, but also because they saw the opportunity uh, in, a, in, a, in a time where the US was obviously uh, in turmoil, in internal turmoil, and uh, yeah, <laughs> saw the, the Leviathan weakened and uh, tried to harpoon it or to get out of its grip, whatever you uh, C is more or less fitting. I appreciate that. Evan's actually asking in the chat uh, that he's seen uh, headlines regarding right-wing activity within German police and military and uh, claims that this is upsetting the political establishment. Well, judging by your, your laughter, maybe that's the answer already. But uh, he wants to know, you know, whether this is real, substantial, if it's just hysteria. What's, what's the inside baseball on that? Oh, uh, well, um, you see, this, this, this would probably make for an own uh, live stream or a, a lengthy talk about crowd stuff. But um, let me get, let me get, uh, let me, let me address this question uh, in a, in a quick way. And maybe uh, if, if people are interested, they, they can look some things up themselves. Um, it's especially fitting because uh, this day marks the 40th anniversary of the Oktoberfest bombing in 1980, where a uh, allegedly right-wing extremist lone wolf uh, assassin um, prematurely detonated his bomb, killing himself. and um, and uh, I believe a dozen other people with, with uh, a few hundred uh, injured, which is, um, which is um, seen as the largest domestic terror attack in post-war uh, German history. And right-wing extremism in at least Western Germany
and I'll postulate this here, has never been existent without fats running the whole thing. I mean, of course, uh, this might come as a very big shock for certain people, <laughs> but um, ever since 1945, at first the Western intelligence agencies, especially uh, the MI5 and the CIA, uh, or, or its its uh, predecessor, the, the OSS, were dabbling with, with such things, and the first uh, organizations like the uh, Bund Deutscher Jugend, the, the, the German Youth League, uh, that would later become banned as uh, proto-terrorist organizations, uh, proto-terrorist right-wing organizations, of course, um, were founded as early as, uh, I believe, 1950 or stuff like that, even before the Federal Republic as a state was founded. And uh, only after... Uh, Okay, okay, 19, sorry, <laughs> the, the Federal Republic was founded in 1949, of course. So shortly thereafter, they had their first right-wing extremist organizations. I was thinking about the rearmament of the Federal Republic, which took place in 1955. But anyway, ever mm -hmm. since that, um, this whole business of uh, feds running right-wing terrorist organizations in Germany and also in, in, in other European states like Italy, um, has gradually shifted from uh, the US and uh, Britain to a certain extent to those state agencies themselves. And um, in, in the, the 80s, where there were a lot of uh, armed uh, right-wing groups doing paramilitary training and there were a lot of street riots between uh between the hard right and the hard left there was always a certain connection to domestic intelligence um there were certain people like one heinz lemke which can be looked up that uh was a a, a contact person and uh, a a shackle grabber sorry to say so from the uh german domestic intelligence service who uh just a uh, big surprise hung himself after he was implicated for uh, giving out uh, giving out guns and explosives to certain groups that uh, would later use them in terroristic ways and uh, he threatened to uh, do a big uh, do a big confession and name the people who had employed him and uh, just one night before this whole thing was to be done he was found hanged in his cell kind of like the Epstein maneuver um, this has always been a big thing in Europe, uh, especially in NATO states, of course. And uh, by judging from the latest big right-wing conspiracy terror organization, we had the uh, so-called uh, uh, National Socialist Underground, the NSU, um, where none of the many threats connecting those uh, three alleged perpetrators to uh, German domestic intelligence and uh, implicating even even uh, foreign powers meddling within this whole uh, network that has never been really snuffed out. None of this has been addressed and this whole uh, thing of finding uh, right-wing cells that uh, usually talk openly about their, their political beliefs in uh, open Facebook groups and WhatsApp chats and what have you uh, has been going on for quite some months now. And as far as I can see it, especially because only today the head of the military intelligence service uh, in Germany uh, had to step down and make way for a for a new uh, leader of the service to be nominated by uh, the uh, the current uh, secretary of defense who is a uh, is, is a, a, a uh, an acolyte, a disciple of, of Angela Merkel. Um, all of this is done to kind of purge the uh, remaining executive services of the Federal Republic and to uh, make them more streamlined to defend Global Homo in Germany. This is pretty much everything I have to say about this. I do not believe that there has ever been any genuine organized and ideologically driven uh, right-wing terrorism in the Federal Republic of Germany. I mean, of course, lone wolves and loonies will always exist, but uh, I do not believe in any uh, hard right-wing 
terrorist conspiracy on uh, German soil since uh, the founding of the Federal Republic. That's it. Wow. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. I, I imagine that the situation isn't terribly much different around the world. I think of here in the United States, uh, whether we're talking a lot of the Muslim terrorist attacks of the last 20 years, there's always an FBI agent or several involved. Uh, the Boogaloo Boys, a lot of this has been revealed to be uh, FBI machinations, the, the base, which was yeah, like a big... This is such an outrageous example, and uh, just just a just a month ago or so, there has been this huge uh, this huge documentary on German state TV, um, founded again by taxpayer money, uh, giving out all this information about the base, even openly stating that the guy who founded it uh, was or used to be, or maybe even still is. Uh, an FBI agent, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It's it's just those are right wing terrorists, and uh, people are radicalizing uh, on the internet, and we need to control the internet, and we need to censor the internet, and everybody should know that. And if you are a law abiding German citizen, you have to uh, support this, or else, or else. What's um, Ursula Haverlock? That was the woman. Who was arrested for some nasty thing that she said? The elderly woman in Germany. Am I thinking of the right person? I know. I don't remember you exactly mean, what the details were surrounding that. What's what's uh out of morbid curiosity? Has there, has there anything changed with that circumstance or with that situation? Is um, she still in prison? No, Is, yeah, sure. Um, I, I believe so. Um, usually. You would get uh, out of prison only uh, for dire um, uh, health uh, circumstances, and pr sometimes not even that. Uh, and, and another uh, elderly person, Horst Mahler, who originally used to be uh, a left-wing terrorist, actually, he used to be one of the founding members of the Red Army faction back in the 60s, um, but later turned uh, right and became uh, part of the 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 um, Reichsbürger movement, uh, people who deny the the factual uh, existence of the state of uh, Germany, of the Federal Republic of Germany, and uh, state that the the German Reich uh, did not uh, cease to exist after 1945. So uh, they are actually citizens of the German Reich and the Federal Republic has no jurisdiction above them and what have you. Um, he was also uh, incarcerated for Holocaust denial and uh, in jail he had to have his leg amputated for for um, metabolic reasons and stuff like that and he is still in jail. Um, he, uh, he actually tried to escape to Hungary and uh, and uh, asked for political asylum but was extradited to germany and went back into jail but let me let me just check quickly whether or not uh, miss uh, haverbeck is still in jail well yeah this is uh there are things and topics uh, you cannot talk about if you're a german citizen and uh, even if you do not live in germany um, because there are some some uh, legal machinations uh, that apply to uh, things you do, whether or not you're on German soil. Um, there have been, I believe, uh, citizens of Australia or so that also held a German uh, citizenship that were uh, uh, the, that were uh, implicated in in lawsuits because of uh, yeah the, the the usual topics as well. So uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's a bit uh, complicated over here, you might say. Well, we actually had uh, Monica Schaefer, who I think I think she's maybe sixty one now. Either way, her and her brother Alfred Schaefer, Monica Schaefer, was actually in the Canadian Green Party, and a few years ago, I met them when they were actually about to be prosecuted for Holocaust denial. And now they actually, 
I believe in 2018 were put in jail. I don't know if they still are. But I remember they were doing a thing about how they were fighting it in court, but they filmed it in Germany. So they actually wow. ended up being tried in Germany and prosecuted in Germany. And then they were also put up on trial in Canada as well over it. That's horrific. Monica and... Yeah, it's yeah. just for your morbid curiosity, it seems that Ursula Haverbeck is... Yeah, okay, now I'm Americanizing names again. It seems that Ursula Haverbeck is still in jail for mm. uh, incitement to hatred and Holocaust now. Serving a two-year sentence, I believe, that started in, in 2018. So, yeah. Two years. And she, yeah. she's in her 90s, right? Yeah, she's 91. Yeah, good Lord. All right, yeah, well, before I... I go ahead. It says, but now Canada supplied um, info on the Schaefer's to intelligence services in Germany. So that's why they ended up getting on trial. Is there a, there's a Canadian group... Um, Kind of like the kind of like the Canadian ADL, I guess, that's giving stuff to the German intelligence. Although the, they said they're not going to stop uh, speaking the truth, that's what uh, Alfred said. So, yeah, pretty horrific stuff. Well, I guess they won't stop being persecuted either. <laughs> it's a nice little guarantee that works that way. Well, to turn away from, I don't know possibly less morbid, possibly more morbid. I'm not really sure. Uh, the other probably big geopolitical happening was early this month, uh, the Serbio-Kosovo -Kosovo deal uh, that Trump uh, was in regions uh, as well. Seems uh, you're getting out again, Josh. Agreeing to each other, so I, I guess where'd you lose me? Right after you mentioned uh, the event in Kosovo, you right when you just said that, but not what it is. <laughs> uh, I don't know what's going on today, gentlemen. My apologies. Yeah, so Serbia and Kosovo have agreed to normalize economic relations. Serbia is moving its embassy, recognizes Kosovo. Uh, I'm wondering, kind of parting shots, since we're coming up along the hour mark here, uh, uh, what your, your impressions are of this and, and, and um, what, it, yeah, what it does to that, to that Balkan region, the Central European region, because this has been described as a Middle Easternization of the Balkans. I'm curious what uh, what your thoughts are on that whole thing. Whoever wants to take it first. Um, I guess I can only say some 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 boilerplate stuff about that. But uh, the fact that this recognition and this this reconciliation actually happened. Um, kind of uh, throw some shade on the alleged influence of the the teachings of uh, Yoram Hazoni on the U.S. Uh, administration, because uh, in his book he uses the 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 breakup of Yugoslavia after the Cold War as a prime example of empires forcing different peoples that do not belong in one country sorry, to live together. Because when the power of the Titoist uh, apparatus fell away, those, those peoples that were um, put together in this this uh, large Yugoslavian conglomerate. Um, the Serbs, the Croats, uh, the the uh, Albanians. No, let me think. Was Albania? Anyway, all those people started jumping at each other's throats immediately. And uh, the, 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 the uh, wars 
on the Balkans, especially the the the, the Bosnian War of uh, 19, 1993 to nineteen ninety five or so, um, were pretty much the 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 the, the history of uh, the European um, peoples fighting for their own nation states, while the the old empires crumbled uh, in a nutshell and were very bloody and. Uh, were accompanied by ethnic cleansing and stuff like that so um by recognizing the kosovo as an albanian state and mind you this is this means that the albanian people now has two states it has albania and it has the kosovo which used to be an integral part of the serbian state and uh yeah kind of these people got along in Serbia until this this uh, whole uh, Yugoslavian uh, breakup thing started to happen. This uh, makes the whole situation and the whole ideology of to every people its homeland and this, this omni-nationalism that even some people in the dissident rights still shill for look a bit, uh, let's say, um, airy a bit invented, a bit fatuous, like it's just something people pull out of their pockets if, if they need a, a big word to, to smite some uh, leftists, to, uh, accusing them of being racial imperialists or stuff like that. But now as it serves certain interests and those are not the interests of the people involved, um, it's all gone now and uh, it's just about um, recognizing a, 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 a small region as an, as an autonomous state that, of course, needs to have its uh, more freedom and stuff like that. So I believe this is just some big game played on the backs of especially the Serbs, but also the, the Albanians to a large degree. And uh, the only people that benefit from this are uh, the US government because it has some, some uh, nice PR work uh to to put out there but uh, also uh israel of course because they made uh the serbs um move their embassy to jerusalem wasn't that and um i believe israel uh, as one of you guys uh, told me before also has some uh, economical interest in the region even if not uh this certainly won't serve to stabilize the balkans and it's uh, pretty much a a punch in the face of the Serbs because, uh, yeah, they they <laughs> let themselves get uh, talked into giving away one of their uh, most precious regions for no obvious reason. That was a very thorough answer. <laughs> I. I wonder, I mean, you have a lot of these, we didn't really talk about this, but uh, Tyler, you alluded to it, the European civilizational state. It just seems like, you know, all of the potential options or opportunities to forge stronger, kind of more sensible alliances are uh, all falling away in service of this kind of Zionist conservative impetus, which has taken over the Trump administration. And it's just, um, I don't really have anything to add other than just to say it's very sad to see. Um, uh, and I wonder what it will do to push some people in the oh, God damn it. you fine, man. I wonder what it'll, yeah, no, my freaking laptop just spazzed out. I wonder what it'll do to just kind of force uh, certain political agents in that region to look east because, you know, what are their other options? Is you can be uh, a, a stooge for Trump and Israel. You can be a pawn for maybe this new EU civilizational state, which maybe won't do too much for you. Uh, or people can start looking east to China or other um, kind of bigger global players um, I don't have any particular insights, but it's just, it's just something to watch, I guess, really is all I'm trying to say over the next couple of years. 
Well, yeah, it's like Kosovo was has avoid, avoided being labeled a Muslim state until now. And that's definitely going to have a lot to do with the kind of alliances that open up in the future, especially in regards to the emergence of the European civilization state that's going to put an interesting position on Kosovo. That's why there's all this pr yeah, pressure totally foreign gestures like you know moving the embassy to Israel, right? As this is going to have consequences in the long term in terms of these kinds of grand strategies that they're playing to. In fact, I believe... So, uh, with that being said... Go ahead, Doug. Oh, it was just... I was just going to say, it was also pointed out in the chat that on the topic of Serbia, they've moved to improve relations with Turkey. Just another example of what we're kind of getting at. Yeah, it's, it's just... I'm not the biggest geopolitical thinker, but it's just there's so many moves happening. And it's just it's going to be something to watch very closely. Um, we're at the hour mark. Uh, I'll just leave the two of you with one last question. then, um, To be a little bit subversive, uh, the whole pretext of this show, Leviathan, is that, in fact, American supremacy geopolitically uh, is declining. I guess my question, and I, I, I'll, I'll point this to you, you, you know, that, that all, all of these changes are happening because American influence is waning. Uh, where, you know, supposing that wasn't the case, where might things go? Supposing so what wasn't taking, the case? Taking COVID into yeah. consideration. Supposing that America is actually not in the decline, and I, and I would, to a certain degree, look at how America perhaps has uh, handled the COVID thing as maybe being somewhat of a testament to its durability. The UK is preparing for a second lockdown. I think I read something the other day about Sweden uh, having a pretty brutal month. Um, it's not so neat and clean um, a narrative to put out there. So I guess my question. Tyler is supposing that in fact America is more durable and there isn't a change in global currency and some of these other things don't happen. Uh, where do you foresee the geopolitical scene moving in the next, in the immediate future? If America isn't so on the verge of waning hegemony, if it somehow maintains it, is that what you're asking? Then where, where it will go? Correct. Correct. Yeah. About, I, I, I just don't think it really will, to be honest. It's not really a... I think it is waning in influence, and I think it's partly because of its refusal to play catch-up to where the world is actually now, largely on account of what it's done and the strategy it's pursued and this emergence of new alliances and new spaces for you know, lesser rogue states to actually get be a part of an alliance that's going to serve their interests. That's just what I think is going to be the case. But, I mean, if... America somehow remains durable. I mean, it's one thing to say it's not going to be unipolar anymore, which I think everyone could agree on. But is it going to, like, purely collapse? I think not primarily because of its foreign policy. I think more because of its internal state and division and its failure to actually maintain a set of elites that can respond to problems internally in a responsible way that's going to go past the current liberal paradigm that's very much failing Americans and average Americans. And that's also partly because of the military ventures involved in that do play a role in a lot of the poverty that you see within America itself, right? So even if you watch speeches by Biden, for example, he'll point to the importance of the American military, but they very little will actually say what it's actually for and how they're benefiting because they're largely not benefiting from it. And so I think that there is an irresponsibility within both parties in America which is partly because it's pursuing a strategy that only benefits a tiny amount of people. So what seems to me to be the case is that if America does survive, it's going to be more as a Brazilian kind of state where, you know, there's disparate ethnic groups and disparate tensions and it's very barely holding together, but it's holding together not so much as a global power anymore, but just as um, a loose economic zone with a ruling state over it. I don't think that it's possible for America to maintain hegemony in the sense that it has done for the past 50, 60 years.
in regards to America, that is. As is people are pointing out in the chat, this does leave opportunities for Europe. But um, did you want to take a shot at that one, Nils? Uh, that is largely dependent on the degree to which Europe would be willing to do such a thing, to assume the position uh, of, of, of the had German or of the Leviathan, at least for the European uh, geographic region for the continent. And I don't really see that. I don't really see that will, and I don't really see the opportunity because um, as far as I can tell, the European nation states, if they are uh, starting to look away from um, Atlanticism and the European Union, they are only looking for other allies because uh, for, for, for allies abroad, uh, outside of the, of the European continent, because um, the European nations post 45 have been thoroughly taught that they cannot stand on their own not as singular nation states and not as purely and kind of isolatory uh, European alliances. And uh, this way of thinking and this, this way of strategizing is so far entrenched, I believe, that um, the, the uh, Visegrad group, for example, would rather... Um, forge a, an alliance of some degree with Russia than to try and, and open up for uh, Central and Western European countries. Um, I think uh, France, for example, might want to uh, look for new alliances with Britain as they did centuries ago. Um, what Emmanuel Macron says about the European uh, civilizational state, well, that's Emmanuel Macron. He's uh, more or less a puppet of uh, global financial interests. And uh, that says uh, a lot about the uh, civilizational state uh, he seems to have in mind. Mm, if something like this should happen, especially when it comes to, to such a structure with a, a Muslim enclave like the like like kosovo uh in its very midst that would be good stuff for a new novel by michel Wilbeck, i believe but it would be nothing that uh, we should we should look forward to from a geopolitical or a uh european folkish perspective um i don't really think america will will be able to to recover from uh, let's say the the last yeah the last thirty years from what happened uh, after the 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 block confrontation ended and especially after what uh, especially from what happened post nine eleven um, there will have to be some some measures to be taken to correct this imperial overstretch that we see now at least uh, some sort of withdrawal from uh, the Middle East. And um, we will see how it comes out of that. I, on another podcast, I was on a German podcast, uh, which was largely about the domestic problems in the U.S., you know, uh, the, the BLM riots and uh, the case of Kyle Rittenhouse and, and um, Trump's uh, inaction with regards to that. Uh, in the end, I was asked where I would see the U.S. domestically um, in within the next 10 to 20 years. And I believe um, there are some sort of, not, not exactly a fractioning like we've seen on the Balkans or some sort of, uh, what, what did you call it? Some uh, Middle Easternization or something yeah. like that? Um, yeah. Nothing like that, but maybe a, maybe something akin to how the, the uh, Frankish empire uh, broke up in three parts, or the the Roman Empire was split up into the Tetrarchy because they they figured it was just too large to be ruled 
uh, by a single person from Rome. And so they, they kind of uh, cut it in four pieces and uh, put an emperor in, in every quadrant of, of the, the whole uh, overarching empire. Something like that might actually happen. Maybe just on a, on a uh, infrastructural basis, not on a, on a large scale political basis, but it would probably be a feasible way to curate some of the most urgent uh, infrastructural, economical, and especially social problems. But on the other hand, I'm not that much of a political scientist. I'm a historian. And uh, if anyone thinks I'm talking bullshit, then just correct me. I'm very interested in how uh, professionals see the American future, as long as they are not work, uh, working for uh, National Review, that is, of course. <laughs> Very well said, yeah. Well, that'll do it for this uh, broadcast to the audience. I hope you enjoyed it. Clap, you stupid bastards. Auf Wiedersehen. Yeah, I also uh, apologize over the, because I know there was a lot of questions that wanted to be asked, but apparently today my PayPal was shut down because last night it was perfectly fine. So I did move to fix the questions, though, but it'll have to take a few business yeah, days. Thanks, to thanks to the we should be NRO back. authors for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Take care. And also, quickly, thanks to Nils for knocking it out of the park. I spent a lot of that show trying to fix these questions. So big thanks for basically the, the Nils show. That was awesome, bro. Doing my best as always. All right. Take care, guys.